two well-known local attorneys have both considered retiring. Maybe you've been considering retiring for a while, but you finally made your announcements. And I think Joel let this be known earlier in the fall, and Tommy kept it a secret from everyone until last week. Um, William T. Tommy Allison II, with a practice over on Rosemont Street. Correct. And Joel B. Sheffield at 113 Jefferson in the Ramey Building. Correct. And even though you have separate practices today, you have some shared history. That's correct. Tommy was here before I was, so he might need to tell his early. Now, I know you went to school, studied law, and graduated University of Texas in 65? Yes. Is that right, Tommy? Mm -hmm. And then what did you do? Well, I was a briefing attorney for the Texas Supreme Court for a year. And then I went into the Marine Corps in August of 66, uh, and I got, uh, was released from active duty in, at the end of August of 69. And while I was over in Vietnam, I, was, uh, I had worked out a deal with Johnny Ramey to come to their law practice and start working. Because uh, they had had somebody working for quite a while, Gary Maddox, but he left and went to practice law in Houston. And uh, so when I got, got back to Sulphur Springs at the end of August, well, I started working with Johnny. And at the time, it was Ramey, Ramey, and Neil. Jack Neal was with him. And uh, Jack <coughs> was appointed district attorney. That slot came open, and so uh, the governor appointed Jack Neal as district attorney, I think. And in any event, uh, so January the 1st, 1970, well, Johnny and I started our practice under Ramey and Allison. Okay. And uh, Right there on, uh, on Je in Jefferson, Jefferson Street. Street. Yeah, same on, same yeah. location. And then, um, anyway, we were going along there, and of course, uh, Craver Brothers was next to us. I used to go in there all the time, and so now that's where the empty parking lot yes, section uh -huh. is there now. But I used to go in there all the time, and uh, I bumped into Joel one summer, and got to talking to him, and found out that he was going to Texas Tech Law School and was planning on coming back. And so I came back and I said, "Johnny, you know Joel? He's over there sweeping the floor at Craver Brothers." <laughs> So he's in law school. I said, that doesn't seem quite right to me. And he said, no, it's not. Let's go. And so we went over there and hired him as a, uh, to come to work for us during the summer. And then we worked out a deal when he got out of law school and passed the bar. He came to work. And it wasn't long before we started out. It was Ramey Allison Sheffield. Okay. So that was about five years after you got started good with uh, yes. that, that first of that year. So you then... Graduated Texas Tech in 74. Texas Tech Law School in 74. Went to a &M 71, Texas Tech Law School 74. Okay. Got out, uh, <clears throat> took the bar July 30th, 31. Drove back the next day and started work with Tommy and Johnny. And uh, yes, I'd worked there. They, they had me there the, the summer before working, collecting delinquent taxes for the city. And that's what I did. I had my lofts in there, and so they, uh, we got to know each other there. And of course, I knew uh, Johnny because I knew his daughter Linda Ramey. She was a year or two behind me, but I, so I knew Johnny, but I didn't know him real well. I'd, I'd see him over at Linda's house. Scared me to death, really, when I'd see him. But anyway, so I didn't know him real well. But of course, first thing I think. Tommy remembers said he, Johnny went to A&M for a while and he thought everybody was an ag major and he said well what what segment of ag did you major in and I said no I was a history major Johnny he said I didn't know they had history major down there everybody's <laughs> supposed to be an ag but anyway so uh, that's that's when I came back uh, August 1 of 74 okay yeah and almost immediately went to work for Ramey and mm -hmm. Allison. Yeah, I was, uh, was still Ramey and Allison okay. for, I don't know, three or four years, I can't remember, anyway. Okay. So. Well, Johnny Ramey, tell me something about Johnny Ramey. I'll let Tom, Tom, Tommy tell better Johnny stories than I because do, probably. Because he's still <laughs> mentioned a lot. Oh, yeah. 
Well, <laughs> Johnny was one of those lawyers. I think the whole time was I was with him, I might have seen him pick up a law book one time. <laughs> <laughs> he just, you know, he didn't read the latest cases or anything like that, but he had this uncanny knack of you could present him with a fact situation and he could tell you what the law ought to be. <laughs> and he was always right. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And uh, it was just incredible. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you'd say, "Well, okay, where is the authority for that?" He said, "I don't know. Go look in those books." <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what we do. But he yeah. was really good about that. And of course, he knew all the people in in Hopkins County pretty much because, as a youngster, he had ridden around with Mr. Lindley, I mm. think, yeah. and. Uh, all over the place and met a lot of farmers and different people like that. And then, of course, he was county Democratic chairman for years and years and years. And uh, he had an oh, a interesting story when he was, he was in SMU Law School and in World War II, so uh, he joined the Army, and, but they were going to let him take the bar exam. So he was in Austin with a lot of officers there taking the bar exam. And, the door swings wide open and in walks Grover Sellers, who was the Attorney General of Texas. At the <laughs> and I remember Johnny saying, he boomed out, he said, where's my good friend Johnny Ramey from Sulphur Springs? And Johnny raised his hand and Grover came over there and he said, don't you worry about this test, we'll take care of you. And Something about the bar. <laughs> the bar. And Johnny said after Grover left, he said, this captain leaned over and said, boy, you are really well connected. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just, you know, that's, that, and, and Johnny could tell a story better than most of anybody I've yeah. ever heard. He yeah, just, yeah. it's really funny. And just little things that you would think would be real mundane, and he could turn it into the greatest story in the world. So, so he never he never got out of law school, you understand. Back then, you could pass the bar and practice law. So he never, we'd kid him, Johnny, aren't you going back to SMU? And, yeah, one of these days, I'm going back. Well, he wasn't going back, but anyway, he, so that was unusual. Well, the characterization that you are painting of Johnny Ramey and Grover Sellers and those you've mentioned is like sort of like the characters that I began to meet when I came here not so very long ago. Um, do we still have personalities like that? Or uh, Well, it's a little bit more difficult because there's there's a lot of new people in town and all, and all didn't grow up together and know each other. And uh, of course, Johnny's dad was a lawyer. Yeah, I was going to say. Yes, yeah, so Tom, Ramey, Ramey, Tom Ramey, and Ramey, yeah. Neil. Tom Ramey. T.J. Ramey. Yeah, T.J. Yeah. And, so, and he was a kind of a character, okay. too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as far as characters are concerned, I guess you have some, but it, yeah. it not like the old no, days I when uh, you just had a lot of fun practicing yeah. law. Yeah. yeah. Well, so both of you, about five years apart, right out of law school, you began to work. So you told me briefly sort of the types of work that you did at the very first. Mm -hmm. So how did you begin to progress to um, being referred yourself? Well, when I when I went there, <coughs> I think it was early on, it seemed like Phillips Coal Company was uh, 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 leasing for coal out in the south part of the county, coal mowing around that area. So. We got the, the job to, to write title opinions for Phillips Coal Company. And that's a lot of what we did. Okay. And uh, the title company, uh, yeah, the title company next door at that time, which was Bailey Abstract Company at that time, they would uh, prepare abstracts of title and we would examine them for Phillips Coal. And it was, uh, it was good business. And, uh, and I learned a lot just going through those abstracts. You, you can you can learn you know different all areas of the law you know as you go through an abstract you know from 1800s all the way up. So uh, that's that's what we did early on, and it was it was it was good work. Do you think in learning as you went through this, for example, the abstracts, mm -hmm. that you also began to learn history, local history? Yeah, there's a lot of local history there. 
and, I, and of course I was a history major, so I was interested in that. And I, I remember, <laughs> I remember one abstract. This isn't real history, but you know, back in the 1800s, and you'd see estates and somebody'd pass away, and uh, and back then they they you know you're still supposed to file an inventory when somebody dies and their wills probate, and had an inventory of this old Civil War soldier, and he said one pair of BVD. I just thought that was funny, you know. <laughs> uh, well, that's probably the way it was. That's all he had. So, yeah, it was a lot of history there. See, we had, Johnny had primarily a real estate transaction type practice. Mm -hmm. He never was real big about going to court, contested type cases and things like that. He would go, a lot of times we would be hired as local counsel when a lawyer from out of town would come in and they were going to pick a jury or something Well, we would help and assist in picking the jury. But uh, generally speaking, ours was a, a transactional type okay. business. And so, you know, we learned a lot that way. Uh, and uh, the thing about Johnny was that he was such a great mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anytime you went in there to ask him a question, he was question, he was more than happy to help you out, like to do it, and it was, I don't know, it was just a really good working relationship. And so, Tommy's talking about uh, John. I mean, a lot of times he may not get in the books, but he would always say, "There's an old line of cases yeah. back in the '30s, <laughs> That's right. or whatever." And you didn't know where it was, but he was right. I mean, there was a line of cases yeah. that he was familiar with. Yeah. He wouldn't have to go look them up. He just says, "Here's what the law is based on these these cases." So, so out of school, you had learned by the book, but when you went to work for Johnny Ramey, you more learned the essence of the of the work, okay. how it related to people and judgments that you could make because you were familiar with how you people... See, the problem that the, the younger people coming out of law school have today, and even if they get a job, uh, you know, it, it may be five or ten years before they try a case on their own. They'll be second or third chair or something like that. and. As soon as I got there, Johnny had handed me a file and he said, go try this case. And of course, we always, we had that local tradition there that whoever, like when I started out, I immediately became city attorney for Silver Spray. Okay. Well, as soon as Joel came on board, yeah. Joel, you're city attorney. <laughs> so, kind of like the newest coach gets to coach softball or whatever, you know, it's kind of... Well, kind so of what would city attorney do in those days? Well, you'd prosecute traffic yeah. tickets and do different things like yeah. that and... Just answer their questions. Answer the your questions subject. They're back in call, primarily. You go I, to the city council meetings. Yeah. Okay. I remember yeah. coming into Johnny one day and saying, this lawyer from out of town wants a jury trial. He said, tell him we don't have any. He needs to appeal it to the county court. <laughs> and so that's what I told him. <laughs> and it worked. You're talking about municipal, yeah. municipal court. Yeah, yeah. There, there was not any jury trials down at that level. So you learned how things needed to work sure, around. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had you talk about, uh, talk about trying cases. And, and, and we didn't do a lot of litigation. I. I probably didn't need to be in a big litigation firm. I, I, the transactional practice where I need to be. But I remember when I got uh, sworn in, uh, passing the bar, and Kearney Brim was the judge, and his son, Jay Brim, was over there being sworn in too. Anyway, it was shortly after that, I know Tommy had some kind of case. And, no, I think it was before I got sworn in. Tommy had me do some kind of jury argument over there. I wasn't even a real lawyer yet, but he threw me to the wolves over there and said, make a jury argument on this case. And so anyway, that's so kind did. of what it was. Yeah, I did. I don't know. I don't remember it being real <laughs> persuasive, but anyway, I did. Yeah. Well, I know when I looked up online about your practices, respectively, it says that Joel... Uh, eligible to practice in Texas, <laughs> private law practice, general civil practice, real estate, family law, estate planning, probate collections, and as we mentioned, that clean history on disciplinary action. <laughs> yeah, that's that's primary. That's a transactional type practice, you know, real estate, probate, maybe collections, a little family law. That's you know, family law can get into litigation, but that's primarily what what I've done all along. Now, I'll ask you this quick question, but I hope we do go back into history because it is so interesting. But you're claiming that you're going to retire, mm -hmm. and 
get out of your business there, your building there on Jefferson Street, mm -hmm. but will you retain some of your clients? No. Okay. Don't so you're going to fully retire. I'm fully retire. Okay. And once I get everything wrapped up, that's okay. going to be the end of it. Okay. And Tommy, um, what it says about you is eligible to practice in Texas and practices in several Texas courts, business, family litigation, commercial litigation, personal injury, real estate, wills, trusts, probate, school law, and you have also a clean history in disciplinary action. So will you retain some of your clients in retirement? Yeah, I'm, pla I'm planning to do that. Like I said, I live at Lake Cypress, and so I'm going to office out of my house. I've made arrangements. If I need to meet clients in Sulphur Springs, I can do that. And just, you know, depends on what, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to be beating the bushes down. I'm more interested in just taking it easy and that type of thing. And, and taking uh, care of those people that you have served yes, for a while. Yes, absolutely. And I've told them if you need something, well, give me a call. And I've given them my cell phone number, my home phone number, and we can go from there. One thing I've always tried to do, because lawyers have such a bad reputation in this regard, is that I always return my telephone calls. And there's a lot of lawyers that don't. <laughs> And uh, so <laughs> Joel always returns his. And that's just the way we, you know, if you got to, that's how you'd want to be treated if you were having to hire a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so uh, anyway, it's. I get a lot of people say, well, if you don't do this, uh, who do you recommend? And a lot of times I'll respond, well, why would I recommend that lawyer when I can't get him to return my phone calls, much yeah. less yours? Okay. You know, mm -hmm. okay. So that's. Yeah. The staff that each of you have, I know probably long term, I know Nell has been in your office for a long time, Tommy. 38 years. Okay. And she's retiring too? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's kind of like breaking up a family in a way. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. In fact, we were talking about, we always have, I'm sure Joel does too, but we always have a Christmas party and get together and we were talking about even after we go through this, we're still going to try to keep up that tradition <laughs> okay. just to see how everybody's doing. So. And you have some people in your office that have been Sherry with you. Sherry Looney's been there nearly 32 years, mm -hmm. and uh, Nikki Carpenter 16 years, wow. and then Bonnie McGlamory more. She retired, I think, 10 plus years ago, and she was there, I don't know, she, close to 30 years, yeah, I long think. Long time. Long time. So there hadn't been a whole lot of, you know, a lot of long timers there. So and I've been real <coughs> fortunate with Nell. <clears throat> when I, I hired her, she was uh, she was secretary over at Travis School, counting lunch money. <laughs> and, and I mean, but she had worked with Rockwell in a whole bunch of different places, and she's probably one of the fastest typists I have ever seen in my life, and just good work ethic and everything like that. And so. We were real fortunate when we were together, mm -hmm. and ever mm -hmm. since then, we've had good, mm -hmm. good people work for us. So Sherry, back Sherry was at the newspaper, and she probably knows more real estate than I do. Just over the years, I mean, she mm -hmm. she should have gone to law school. She came. She was a journalism type person, and Tommy was primarily responsible for hiring her. He, you know, at that time, but yeah, we, uh, she we, didn't know anything about it. But she's worked into it. We, Sometimes we'll call up Joel's office and say, I need to speak to the real lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the secretary's always know more of the lawyer anyway. Well, you came on about 75, is that right? 74. 74, I'll, okay. So, it was Ramey, Allison. Ramey, Ramey. Ramey, <laughs> Ramey, and Neil. Yeah. The, and then Ramey and Allison. Allison. Ramey, Ramey, Allison, Allison Sheffield. Sheffield. Mm -hmm. When did Mr. Ramey exit the picture? Well, he... Uh, he, he retired in 1992 or three, okay. and that's when I bought the building okay. from him. And but but he he kept coming to the office. We always kept his office open up there, and he could come in. He'd come and go as he wanted to, and we just kind of had a little situation. Whatever he brought in, he got half, and I I got half. So whatever he wanted to do, fine. If he didn't want to do it, fine. 
and we all we, we could always tell if it's Johnny coming to the front door the way he slammed the door or shut the door. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's, Johnny's here, and we still, and he passed away in uh, July 4 of 2004, mm -hmm. and uh, we we swear sometimes somebody will come in, so that sounds just like Johnny coming in the way the door closed. But uh, but we he was always there and available to answer questions or whatever. <laughs> right up, you know, he 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 was he, he was a real mentor, and, and like I said, every, everything I learned came from Tommy and Johnny. I mean, that's that's where I learned it. You don't learn it in law school, you know. You know, you got to get out. Well, do you think that, and maybe all little towns are the same, but in our town, here's the courthouse, here's the banks, lawyers' offices, the coffee shop. Do you think everything being in this close proximity and people seeing each other um, often kind of lends itself to knowing the people, um, maybe doing a better job? Oh, I think so. In fact, I remember <clears throat> there was a lawyer in Paris with uh, McLaughlin. I think his name was Fisher. Mm -hmm. And he would go to all the coffee shops every morning to talk to people and everything. And when he got ready to pick a jury, he knew everybody and pretty well knew their likes and dislikes and all that kind of thing, and he was invaluable. Uh, of course, my problem is I don't drink coffee, so I, I wouldn't be <laughs> I don't at either, the coffee so shop. I don't either. <laughs> so, but to answer your question, yeah, I think you, you see a lot of them. And I'll tell you what else you do is that uh, just by going to court, you see a lot, of, a lot of lawyers and see a lot of people there, too. And you're talking about <clears throat> Johnny knew the countryside, real estate, mm -hmm. and Johnny knows, I mean, Tommy knows it better than I do because in the old days, I think, I've heard, they used to get out and drive around and Johnny could point out so-and-so owns that mm -hmm. track of land, that's owned by the so-and-so family. I mean, he yeah. knew every family, what track of land they owned, and that, I mean, that's so important. In fact, that's <laughs> what, when I first came with him, every Friday afternoon, yeah. we'd take off about three o'clock and he'd drive, we'd drive around the countryside a different section of the county mm -hmm. and he would point out what family owned which farm or dairy and that type of thing and give me a little history to go along with and stuff like that and it was, you know, it was, that really helped me out a lot. Well today we depend on the internet so much instead of our own memories. Mm -hmm. We can just quickly Google something or look something up. But back then, you really had to remember yeah. and kind of uh, be on your toes all the time. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned earlier in our conversation that you were a briefing attorney for the Texas Supreme Court. Yes. That seems like a lofty job for a person right out of school. Well, the Supreme Court would hire people right out of law school. Okay. As as, and uh, they would, uh, you'd interview for the job, you'd get recommendations from people and things like that and uh, I was real fortunate uh, I worked for Judge Hamilton who since passed away but uh, he was good friends with a fellow by the name of Muck Edwards who was the general counsel for Gulf Oil back in those days and my dad when uh, Muck started off used to give Muck a ride to work every day and so there was that connection, and it was very instrumental in getting me, getting helping me to get that position. And of course, they looked at your grades and what all you did in law school and things like that. So, uh, but they, yeah, there's nine of them, and they hire nine ever. Hmm. In fact, uh, they all these courts of appeal have briefing mm -hmm. attorneys now and mm -hmm. things like that, and they didn't. That didn't exist at the time, because I know my first paycheck was. Three hundred and fifty dollars, and I had to wait until September the first till it went up to five hundred and fifty dollars because the legislature passed the pay <laughs> rates. <laughs> so, well, speaking of the internet, I know that changes almost every kind of business, and so much for the better. But probably um, fewer people are needed in a law office now with uh, the access to records. Would you say? How things how have things changed in that the industry? The thing you'll find is that about every time I go to court, about if you have ten cases on there, and especially in family law, half of them will be pro se or the people will be representing themselves, and they will download the forms from the internet and all that, and 
Supreme Court has instructed the district judges that, listen, you've got to help these people out to prove their case and help them along and all that. And so, you know, you just, it's, it's really interesting what judge will ask. In fact, the judges have gotten where now, they just ask them the questions mm -hmm. <laughs> to prove up the case. And then most people show up with an order, order already prepared and they really help them out that way. Well, as a result, that's cut into it quite a bit. And uh, you uh, you see that with powers of attorney, deeds, and yeah. all kinds of things, all kinds of transactions. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> internet's, people are going there, and I don't blame them. They're trying to save some money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, But in our office, you know, you go in, uh, go through the back, and books lying in the walls, and and uh, we used to use those books, but mm -hmm. we don't look at them anymore. Uh, don't look at them at all. No, there's and they're, no, no they're, market for no, them. No market at all. They're worthless. Mm -hmm. But they look good, and people walk through, and they always say, you read all these books? <laughs> and, oh, yeah, I read them all. <laughs> <laughs> Take one home with me every night. Yeah, every night. <laughs> that's right. So it just, makes a lovely backdrop for it, a photo, it, too. It, yeah. it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> You're right. Well, tell me what, Joel, what you plan to do. As of January 1st, will it be that soon that you retire? Well, I don't know. That's probably, I don't know. It'll be something after, sometime after January 1st. Of course, I'm, I'm leaving Soft Springs. What? Oh, you didn't know that? I did not hear that. Oh, you didn't know that? No, I'm, I'm moving to College Station. I'm, Why? I, you know. <laughs> He's I, an Aggie. I, I, I thought you knew that, but uh, no, I, I am an Aggie. And... Uh, I don't know. It uh, you know I play golf or have historically, not very well, but I play. And so anyway, I could play golf. Just I follow the Aggies. I've always been an Aggie. I just that's you have that's, really that's, that's, that's my past. That's my pastime. That's what I do, and I enjoy it. And I just thought being down there, I'll just be right in the center of the. Now they've got a new high-powered coach, and we'll see whether he's any good. I think it'll be an interesting time to be down there. I didn't do that because of that, but anyway, that's just the way it is. But, uh, but yeah, I'm moving to College Station, and of course, it's there's no better place in Soft Spring. Let me say that I'm not, not but uh, there's a you know college town kind of keeps you young, I think. And uh, back when I was going to A&M, everybody as soon as I left, I said I don't ever want to come back. But now, <laughs> lots of folks are going back, and yeah. so but that's what I'm that's what I'm going to do. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do, Tommy, to stay busy? I know you're going to do some lawyering. Oh, of course, we've lived at the lake for uh, since 2004. So, uh, and my wife's a real estate broker, and she's planning on cutting back and doing things. So, uh, we'll just see what comes up, that type of thing. I don't think either one of us are interested much in traveling. About five or six years ago, she slipped and fell, and shattered her kneecap so she has whatever this weather changes or whatever she has yeah. some real problems and uh, so uh, you know just we might take some like we I think we want to make a trip to Big Bend for example we've been talking about that for three or four years and doing things like that but uh, there's just a lot of things to keep busy with and uh, so I'm looking forward to it and I want to stay I'm going to keep my radio show going and yes. then I've uh, talked to Karen Weatherman at the Senior Citizen Center about stopping by after that's over at 8.30 and be there at the Senior Citizen Center for an hour in case any veterans want to come by or their families and if they have some kind of legal problem or some kind of problem with the VA uh, I can talk to them without any charge and see if I can help them out and if not, I have some people I can refer them to that I have a lot of confidence in. So I'm going to try to follow up on that. And then, of course, we still have a work with the Veterans Memorial Committee going mm -hmm. on. You do. Uh, got some work going on, uh, not too much, with the Industrial Foundation and uh, represent the hospital locally and that type of thing. So uh, just there will be some things to do. And I hope to get to town a couple of times a week see stay in touch have you finished your interest in the toy soldiers not really well yeah um, that was really one of the things that precipitated this because I had in fact, Doug came by and made a video of my collection it took him a while <laughs> and uh, there were uh, 
I, that was getting to be a real challenge because if something happened to me, hey, I didn't want to leave my family with all that to dispose of. So <clears throat> I was fortunate. I'd met a, a collector several years ago, and he was interested in my collection. So I, at that time, I had about 12,000 figures and 10 or 15 big cases. And so we worked out a deal, and he came by and took them all off my hands. And once he did that, then that freed me up as far as my office was concerned to think about selling it. Uh, which I've done, and so um, as to answer your question about did I still uh, keep up my interest? Yeah, I carded a couple of cases, so I've got about <laughs> 1,500 still. At time. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, but Myra likes uh, she likes the Indian elephants and all that stuff, the color on some of those, and I've got my big boats and things. So it's yeah, they're still there. Well, I you, I can tell by the twinkle in your eye that you are looking forward to things after mm -hmm. retirement, Tommy. And you too, even though you're no, I'm leaving, looking forward to it. No. leaving our area. No. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I was thinking about Tommy. I got all my A&M sports stuff stuck, stuck up in the vault up there. I don't know what to do with it. It's not worth anything. I wish somebody would come take it off my hands probably because it'll well, probably be tossed one of these days. You'd no. be surprised. Well, I know. Yeah. Well, what about it? Well, you can sell it to Brad Johnson. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Brad might buy it. But, uh, so. Thank you for sharing with us here at Channel 18 and KSST. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. I no, appreciate it. Very happy retirement. All right. Thank you. Thank you.